How the hell is Korea? <laughs> Hot. <laughs> Hot? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's like they're, they're about, uh, I'd say about a, two, three weeks ahead of us over here as far as heat. You know, it's in like the 80s every day. Yeah. Sometimes 90. But, yeah. Polluted. Oh, well. China is fine dust, ultra fine dust. It's all smoggy over there. And, but other than that, it was nice. <laughs> you yeah. said you saw uh, the, through binoculars uh, North Korea, right? That's yeah, you can see that. There's yeah. like a, a river, a river that separates them, and you can look out. And there's like a, right at the border, and you can see. I saw people over there like working in some fields and stuff like that, and some farmers. You could see them through binoculars. All right, <laughs> so you were right at the border. For one day, little like uh, excursion I did one day, I went up there. Yeah, it's, it's really it's close. It's only about like. Less than an hour from Seoul, so <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty close. Yeah, <laughs> we're right there. So, and there well, here memorial. we've had, we've had so much rain that mosquitoes are the main problem. Already? Oh. Yeah, yeah, we're getting them over here. I mean, it's not as much. It's not a lot, but we're starting to get them over here. I saw one in my room the other day. Yeah. So. Well, I I have uh, an outdoor bed uh, on which I put a uh, screen tent, and and on the tent I see twenty, thirty mosquitoes waiting to eat. <laughs> 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 this is probably the only place on uh, the North American continent where I don't have mosquitoes on me. <laughs> but I get to watch them and go, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want like, uh, you think you could use uh, like a cheesecloth or something? Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, what does a cheesecloth do? I think that's what it's called. They they they're like filters, the screen filters, but they're like, uh, you know, you put them on your door to block out mosquitoes and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. these guys, there are enough of them. They're out by the millions, so there's always a way for them to find a way into a room if it's not sealed. So this little tent gives me about a foot in all directions except my back when I'm sleeping on it. Uh, uh, so I get I get to watch mosquitoes trying to get me. Maybe uh, you could use a bigger tent, <laughs> a bigger uh, one that's... Uh, uh, a bigger one, what do you do in the winter time with it? You know? uh, I mean, you don't have to worry about mosquitoes. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, this I is uh, about as good a size as, as you can get because it gives you the ability to move your hands and feet and mm. not be touching at the ends, you know, the sides or the ends. Anyways, how's it going? Um, just, my mom just came back from Canada. She, yeah. Uh, she was visiting her family. Yeah, she went with her mom because her family came down. Her mom came down and she went. Yeah. Went, went back with her, stayed a week. She, I guess you know she needed a break. You know. Yeah. So, Came back, I think it was Saturday. And um, everybody getting over the trauma. Yeah, she, yeah, everyone's pretty much fine. Um, my mom's yeah. fine. She's not like 
I can't function or anything. It's nothing like that. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um. Well, you you had enough lead up time, I guess, to, yeah. to prepare everybody for an eventual happening. How did you deal with uh, that trauma when you went to uh, when with Tom? Well, it was uh, different because it was always a feeling that. They had done it, done him in, mm-hmm. so it mm-hmm. was more uh, an investigative period of time rather than a a uh, worrying mm-hmm. about anything. Yeah. 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 Certainly, we came to the conclusion that um, Tom's illness was basically the end product of electromagnetism, uh, but his death was more precipitated by uh, drugs over a three-month period given to him by his doctor's uh, secretary who would get free samples from phar- pharmaceutical companies and and oh. Tom would be taking all that stuff and then of course going to the hospital uh, and being fine enough to sign his lottery ticket at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and being dead at 4.30, 5 o'clock so looking at at what was happening in the room, it it was all suggestive that he was not going to go home, that they were going to make sure that was his last stop. Yeah. When, I like- when a, uh, a doctor comes to you and says, Mr. Keeley, what do you think about DNR. And I looked at them and I said, do not resuscitate? What are you talking about? Well, that gave me uh, a hint about what they had in mind. And, uh, of course, when the so-called coroner uh, went to the hospital and, and supposedly claimed him to be uh, mortally ill uh, by reading notes from the nurses, which he did not understand himself and had to read to Jennifer on the telephone what the notes said. And, of course, uh, Jennifer said, well, if he was getting fed intravenously, uh, was there any bottle in between the food and the body? And they said, the coroner said, yeah, there was. And that's when Jennifer said they killed him. So she would know a lot more than I do about the medical practitioners and and how they go about doing things. Uh, It it was basically a uh, preordained activity, get them into the hospital and get rid of them because he has divulged the fact that he's always been an agent for the police. Uh, now, I, I was that's what I was going to ask you, like, what, what, these doctors, and I guess th- it's all of them working together. So, like, so why is it some doctors are more successful than others? Is it, like, some doctors, they do what they're told and they 
kill well, or whatever. Yeah. Surgeons have the legal right to kill. And uh, coroners are the highest paid bureaucrats in the system of government. Really? No, no. So if they get the word, do this person in, the surgeon is the person with the right to kill, and the coroner has the right to cover up. So, do they, are they linked? Yeah. I I remember that code, uh, yeah, I'm sure they work together. The the 007, right, license to kill, is that linked to the doctor, surgeon? Well, it's linked to following instructions from the police and the politicians and the bureaucrats. So they don't follow instructions from junior politicians, but if the premier or the prime minister says do something, they do it. Or if uh, the top bureaucrats, who are more likely to be the ones calling the shots, because bureaucrats don't get elected, they just collect pensions after 30 years of service. Mm-hmm. They uh, they give the word, and uh, I guess the doctor, female doctor from India, came into the room and she asked me what I thought about DNR. That left me with no doubts that somebody was about to uh, to do something dastardly because he was sitting on the bed and recovering from his collapse at Walmart and uh, there was no doubt in my mind that as long as they fed him he would be back to normal. Mm. That the drugs and the electromagnetism is what shuts down your body. And they were feeding him prednisone. Prednisone is a drug that shuts down your repair mechanism. Uh, It's basically used uh, in order to stop a certain disease from progressing further. They shut down the entire body's mechanism for fighting disease on the pretext that then they'll be able to get at this specific illness that this person supposedly has but the minute you shut down the entire system you can be killed by any thing that that uh, would normally be prevented by a normal body you know what, what my dad it was I remember he came back from a doctor that I, I guess the doctor di- diagnosed him, and as, and then he as soon as he started taking some medication, I guess they recommended he couldn't. He started stuttering a lot and could yeah. could even talk really. It, it like cut off his communication. But yeah. when I noticed, you know, when him his brain wasn't working. It was right after, uh, around that time, I learned who you were, and I started communicating with you. Yeah. And it happened, and I, I don't know, I don't have, I don't have direct, so much direct, like hard proof, 
But I have a feeling like it was some type of message or uh Well, you know <laughs> what uh a certain uh German former Secretary of State for the US uh, used to call those people useless eaters. Mm. So a useless eater is a guy who collects a pension and is not a friend of the system. Or he is a former friend of the system who knows too much. Hmm. Now, your dad was a pharmacist, wasn't he? Yeah. So he would know a lot about drugs and and uh, what can do what to whomever they pleased. And he may have known of occasions where they did. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Pretty, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, they have those types of people. Like, you remember how Michael Jackson was killed? The yeah. guy, his name was Conrad something. He, yeah. You know, they have, I guess, these people they can call and, you know. So I guess it's all types of professions and stuff like that. They can just give these people a call and they 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 just do it? They That's handle it. it. Yeah. Wow. And it usually ends up with a, uh, a specialty uh, location where uh, they're used to doing it more than in other places. And I would suggest to you that a lot of people who would normally have gone to the hospital in Ottawa but needed to be done in would end up being taken to Kempville. Mm. There's much less uh, possibility that somebody would blow the whistle in Kempville. Mm. And you also have, you know, a lot more doctors these days who come from countries where the culture is different about the value of human beings. Yeah. Yeah. India being a a prime place. Yeah, Yeah, you're right about that. My dad told me, like, a lot, so many, a lot of the people he worked with were from other countries. Yeah. Him being one of them. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, we don't want to pay pension to a couple of billion people. Yeah. So uh, they're given an opportunity to live out their life until they uh, have no value to the culture. Mm. And, and then those people are done in. So. When you take people trained in in medicine in those countries and then come and apply their trade in in North America, they look at government much differently than somebody born and raised uh, in North America. Mm-hmm. And and. If if they only get a little bit of a hint that somebody is no, no longer needed, they know what that means. Yeah, and that's the, the I guess that's linked to the whole uh, the gene thing where you have with the migration, like you have a bunch of people come in from another part of the world and. They offer some type of to the system because of their their genes. They there's no design. doubt that that parents pass on uh, genetics, but there's also no doubt that many countries in the world operate 
a genetic engineering system. So uh, if, if genes that are imposed upon a body in which they were not born, uh, they have the capability of surviving the transfer and transmittal to their descendants over a four-generation period. So that means great-grandparent to grandparent, grandparent to parent, and parent to offspring. And, I mean, you don't have to be very smart to look at what's happening in sports these days. Everybody's looking in baseball, for example, to to uh, grab onto the sons of great baseball players so that they continue the line. Uh, Toronto is very good for doing that kind of stuff. Uh. But any, event, mm-hmm. uh, any event, I have no doubt that I was genetically engineered. Uh, but something went wrong in in their uh, expectations. I became stubborn, but not for their purposes. And I know that my parents were stubborn and were, uh, well, I I call them my parents. The place I was raised, (laughs) (laughs) they they, um, uh, had no no real reason to get married uh, except to front for genetically engineered children. Father was Irish, uh, spoke only English. Mother was French, was totally bilingual, spoke to us in French, spoke to him, her husband, in English, and never had the feeling that they were speaking to each other as much as at each other. They they were communicating about a task to be done rather than uh, liking each other. Hmm. I'm sure there's plenty of uh, families out here like that, but uh, we we don't we don't that's not something I would see on the surface. I'm sure. No, it's basically seen when you're raised in that environment. Yeah. Glenn, what was that story or that happened to you with the uh, with the vase? You were like in some hotel or motel or something, and. He told that it was years ago. I'm trying to remember what that might be. I think he gave hints to you about, you know, like a, you're from a test tube or something, something like that. Well, everything in my growing up made no sense to me at a later date when I look back on it. And much of it had to do with being uh, told that I had a special role to play and that the special role uh, had its origin in um, uh, Regal, Quebec, 
regal if you think of it as as English rather than as the French word. It's go again, born again, you know. Yeah. Make it happen like you did the last time type of thing. And when I was uh, uh, five or six years old, about 1948-49 time frame, my mother brought me to Rigo because they had a grotto, a cave, uh, dedicated to what they called the Blessed Virgin, Mary, Mother of God. And I remember things like uh, being on the train and asking uh, my mother if I could have something off a tray that that some servant on the train was selling, going bench to bench type of thing, uh, maybe chocolate bars or chips or soft drinks or whatever. And I remember my mother saying that she didn't have the money. Uh, and and she was sorry, but she, she couldn't afford to buy me anything. And then we got to Regal, and got off the train, and that's kind of halfway between Ottawa and Montreal. And uh, I was walking with my mother, and there was thousands of people there attending some kind of uh, religious ceremony when I was taken by the hand and brought inside a building apart from my mother and uh, uh, I was uh, basically told inside the building something as I had been told before by my mother that I had a special role to play and I, I remember being told that that role was linked to um, a female breast. And I didn't even know at the time what a breast was. They had to kind of explain it to me. And uh, uh, it was a guy in, in a red tunic or gown or something like that who was telling me that. Um, and and to remember that is basically the message they were trying to get out. And uh, eventually they took me out and took me over to my mother, handed her, uh, handed me over to her. She had been at some ceremony and uh, wasn't surprised that I had not been with her. Uh, and then on the way back home, um, she uh, she asked me on the train if I wanted something, chips or chocolate bars or whatever. And I said, uh, but you don't have any money. And she said, I have money now. And, and whatever I wanted, she gave me. So I had no no doubts in my mind that she had got money from somebody at that thing in Rigo that she didn't have on the way up. And and that kind of activity uh, through the 16 years that I lived at home uh, was normal. First, there was nothing, then there was something, and and, uh, at at 16, of course, I went off to uh, Toronto to go to college from Ottawa, and uh, one day, there was no money to pay for anything, 
the next day I'd receive uh, uh, money more than I expected, and, and uh, that continued until my mother uh, basically was on the verge of dying or something uh, many years later. And and I was sent fifty thousand dollars from from somebody, a woman called my mother, who who basically I couldn't figure out where she would get fifty thousand dollars, but that it wasn't just me; it was me and my my sisters each got some amount of money. The way it was presented to me, however, was not, this is for you. It, my sisters were trying to get the money, I guess, and they said, this is from mom. She wants you to invest it for her until she gets out of whatever hospital. or uh, So all my life, I I felt that somebody was paying to have me do certain things and that it was funneled through my mother but it was not hers. Now that I don't know if that answers your question but uh, I, I remember something about a vase, but I don't remember the details of what I used to know. When you get to be 78 years old, you know, these, <laughs> these things disappear. <laughs> I think maybe that, you were saying you're like, you, you were on the road or something and you're staying at some hotel or something. Maybe it was before you kind of knew what was going on, but then there was like a vase, and it might have been in your hotel room or in a window or something. Some clue for you, but anyway, I can't yeah. remember all of it. But but I when I when did I tell you that about ten years ago? Probably. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, probably close to that. How long have we known you? How long have we known each other? Years. Do you remember I, when I first called you, Glenn? No, I can't. Uh, I think. <laughs> yeah. I think we started. Uh, I want to say, end of '08, maybe the January of '09. So yeah, probably ten. Yeah. Ten and a half, almost ten and a half years, almost. Yeah. Wow. It's crazy how time just flies like that. I can't believe I've known you for that long. Well, you know the the problem that I have is that I went on the road for ten years and spoke to hundreds of thousands of people. So uh, a lot of times I'd get phone calls from people saying, I met you in Edmonton or Vancouver or whatever. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you you forget the details. Yeah. You forget them, but when somebody... Sometimes it's usually something, uh, music or uh, emotion that will like jolt it, like it'll come back. But it has to be yeah. something significant, like an impact. For me, it's like an impact on my life yeah. somehow. So. I always had a good memory until uh, I was about 70 years old and started uh, losing words, uh, words that are simple, that I used every day, and all of a sudden I'd stop in the middle of a sentence, and I couldn't remember the word that went in there. 
And and part of it was because I was raised in the two languages. Uh, you you at one stage of the game wonder whether the word you're looking for is in French or in <laughs> English. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, well, my dad, like when he the the signs of that disease, um, they, he 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 stopped speaking English. It's like he completely forgot, and he reverted mm-hmm. back to the first language. Yeah. And, and I hear that's 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 common for people who get that. But yeah, you were talking about bureaucrats earlier, and I, I was watching something about Vikings and, you know, how they would, a lot of what they did was raid other towns. Yeah. Rape and pillage. I mean, that's a lot of human history, and I think these this, this these types became bureaucrats because as I've been watching, like, all the stuff about bureaucrats coming out, it's that's what they do. They raid people's wealth, but they do it in the modern way for today. They with tax paying money and everything, they just steal <laughs> so much money. Yeah. And, and well, they, they they belong to uh, associations that let them conspire for the purpose of getting around the rules that apply to them. If, if, uh, if it says, for example, that you're not allowed as a uh, civil servant bureaucrat, you're not allowed to look up the Internet and make judgments on whether you hire uh, people by what is written on the internet because it may not in fact be true so you're not allowed to do it well what they do is they call their American counterpart and the American calls their Canadian counterpart and from the information that they are given on the person they want to recruit that is acquired outside the country, they make their decision. And if somebody says, did you check the Internet to get this information? They say, no, of course not. That would be illegal. But in fact, what they called is their association in a different country and have them check the Internet and and call them back. So. Uh, what I'm seeing now, I don't know if you're watching. Uh, I've been uh, watching uh, what's going on again with the. Uh, the politics in the U.S. They're, now they're saying that they're holding the people who broke the rules for so long that that they're going to hold these people accountable. And I'm seeing, it, it seems, from my where I'm standing, it seems like the walls are getting, are just closing in on them and you're seeing their reactions. The things that they say that these, they're nervous because well, be. right now, <laughs> if I was a bureaucrat, I'd be nervous <laughs> yeah. because because their bosses are the ones who want to get rid of them. They have served their purpose of being human beings in their environment when controlling the earth was most important to their bosses. But their bosses now have a different agenda. Their bosses want to control outer space. And therefore, 
the jobs, the tasks assigned to bureaucrats in the past 40 years are irrelevant to the task of opening up outer space for uh, mining and manufacturing and and uh, travel and and living under totally different circumstances and therefore these millions of bureaucrats that exist have jobs that are irrelevant to the task at hand, especially starting in 2020. So all of those bureaucrats will be put on the market for some uh, surgeon to deal with. They they don't want to be paid tax uh, not taxes um, uh, pension plans for doing nothing of value in the future. Mm. So yes. what you're looking at, you're going to see a lot of change about who's guilty of doing what because what they were applauded for doing in the past, they are going to be exposed of doing in the future. And and instead of a reward, it'll be a trip trip to Kempville General Hospital. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. But it, they're being um for this whatever uh I guess controlling space and it's it seems like they're being replaced. Right? Because yeah. I mean smaller people, groups uh different tasks. So the rules would be they're... different, right? And therefore, genetically engineered differently. Mm. And 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 how you take over a country in order to begin a, a totally new approach to things is you create a war in a country, and you move the properly re-engineered children with their parents into refugee camps and then you transfer them as a group to the countries you want to change and they come in as children and 15, 20 years later they are doing the job that was planned for them 20 years before. The parents die off. The children have a new task. And that's why Syria is the center of activity for genetic engineering. And most of the immigrants into Canada have been Syrians over the last four or five years. Are they going into the? Um, it's not just Canada they're immigrating to. Are they immigrating to the like the, those Nordic countries up there? Yeah, every every country has to have new border guards, yeah. different approach to things. That's what we're you, seeing now. That's, <laughs> we're seeing. New policemen. Uh, and so and, everything and so, that's about control has to be changed. Yeah, but th- what's sad is that I'm seeing <laughs> it's being presented as you know the people are going to be <laughs> free or whatever, and they, just they, just <laughs> think how many kids are standing at the U.S. Mexico border. Yes, 
And everybody says, but they're only children without understanding that they are children who've been programmed in a South American country for a different task than their parents have. And once their parents get them into the country and accepted as citizens there, they are then in line for the new jobs. And the parents are sent back in many cases. Mm -hmm. And the children stay behind with a different approach to life. You know, I remember when I was in Canada, when uh, Stephen Harper was in in, in office, you pointed out that he was his job was to be as far to the right and nasty yeah. as possible, so there would be a push to the left. And you referenced uh, like that happened in in Europe, that you know people were so tired of the Nazis that they went completely left. But it seems like now, I think I understand now why so many, like a lot of especially with the media you seeing a lot of them seem to be at this huge slant to the left. But now around the world, people, like, as far as elections and government, the government seems to be, they call it right-wing populism. They're more yeah. to the, they're, they're like in power now. Yeah. They call them nationalists or whatever. It's it's moving to the right. It's like a ping pong. Uh, yeah. There's no doubt about it that Trump didn't get elected by the people who were in charge 10 years ago. You know, Democrats were running the world, and and now here we are four years later, and most countries are moving to the right. Same. That's... And and and. 40, 50 years ago, they were on the right. Nazis. Yeah. Don't forget the word Nazi. If you change how you spell the sound, N-A-T-S-I, Nazi, is the same word as saint. Yeah. S-A-I-N-T, same letters as Nazi. Just keep shifting back and forth and the people who were in charge have no power and the people who weren't in charge are gaining power and you need much less uh, in the size of a population so we've all been told there are too many children in the world for the food that's available and everybody's cut back from having five, ten children to having one, maybe two. So the new population is much smaller and it forces the countries to bring in workers who bring their children who have been programmed differently. All of this is planned exactly and and has been for thousands of years yeah huh. well gentlemen it is time to feed the cats they have come to rescue themselves <laughs> <laughs> they're in power right now Power. <laughs> That's why if you look at the word meow, it is the first four letters of me owner. Oh, so uh, <laughs> me owner. <laughs> they own the house here. <laughs> All right, I guess it, <laughs> you got to go serve uh, the owner. Yeah. 
<laughs> but don't be shy. You can call again tomorrow or the next day or the day after. Okay. And I'll always find room for you. Thank you. You and Danny. You. Yeah. Much well, appreciated. Yeah. Because you you are my voice that I don't have time to give to yeah. other people. <clears throat> Yep. Thank you for calling. Talk to you next time. Okay. All right. Bye for now. Bye, Danny, too. Bye.